president of the League of Women Voters of St. Louis Park, and your moderator for this candidate forum. I would like to welcome all of you tonight on behalf of the League of Women Voters in Nataka, Eden Prairie, and Hopkins. The League of Women Voters, a volunteer nonpartisan political organization, encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. We have several community partners here tonight, Every Child Matters, Healthy Legacy, Jewish Community Action, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, and National Council of Jewish Women. Representatives for the League of Women Voters and our partners will be available in the lobby after this forum to meet with the candidates and the audience. The League does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters. It's our purpose in sponsoring these meetings, or meetings such as this, to provide you with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss issues face-to-face -face that are important to you. There's never enough time to cover all the issues in a limited time such as this. If your questions were not addressed, feel free to contact the candidate directly. We ask that no campaign buttons, signs, or literature be worn or distributed until after the forum. In the lobby, outside the double doors. This event is now being broadcast live on Comcast Channel 16. The, the candidate forum will be rebroadcast repeatedly in its entirety on Comcast Channel 16. It will also be available by streaming video the city website and at www.lwbmeph.org. Individual recording and photography that does not disrupt this event is allowed. Tonight's questions have been submitted by our live audience online and by our community partners. Questions that are unclear, hostile, or of a personal nature will not be used. Those that fall in the same general arena or area may be consolidated cards become the property of the League of Women Voters. If the answer was unclear to you, feel free to submit a follow-up question or to ask the candidate after the forum. Now I'll introduce the candidates. For Senate District 48, Steve Switzinski and David Han. For House District 48A, Lori Pryor and Mary Shapiro. For District 48B, Jennifer Moon and Ben Sherlock. Thank you all for coming tonight. We will begin with two minute opening statements. Following that, the candidates will have one minute to respond to questions submitted by the audience. Our candidate forum will wrap up with one minute closing or statements from each candidate. And we will begin our opening remarks with Steve Swidinski. Thank you to the League of Women Voters, the moderators, and everyone in attendance tonight. For those of you that don't know me, I came from Superior, Wisconsin as a high school graduate in the 1970s. Times were tough in Wisconsin, so I hitchhiked down here to this Minneapolis looking for an opportunity. I didn't know it then, but I was looking for a Minnesota miracle, and I found it here. I worked my way through college at the University of Minnesota. I met my true kindred, kindred spirit, Addie, and we got married. We couldn't afford both of us to go to school at that time, so I finished my degree while Patty worked and then later went back to school to earn her teaching license. We had a couple of great kids, Erica and John, and I got a job teaching American government, my passion, at Eaton Prairie High School. For over 30 years, I've taught my students the importance of political efficacy, civic virtue, and the common good. As I reflect on that time, I realize miracles don't happen in a vacuum. They happen when people get together, put partisan politics aside, and work towards a shared vision. I'm running for Minnesota Senate because I want to be part of the next Minnesota miracle. Health, economy, education, and transportation are all interconnected, and our policy should be as well. For 33 years, my students depended on me to show up do my job, and complete the lesson planned by the time the bell rang and the course ended. As a parent, <coughs> a spouse, and a teacher, I know how important it is to listen, honor my commitments, and get the job done. You can count on me to bring that same work ethic 
and standard of excellence to the Capitol. Because as elected officials and candidates, I think that our constituents are still depending on us to listen, be prepared, plan ahead, and meet our commitments. If we put partisan politics aside, we can meet the challenges of the 21st century and build a brighter future. Thank you. David Han. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me to be here as well. My name is David Han. I have been a resident of Eden Prairie for the past 33 years. My wife, Ann, and I, we've raised four children in this community. Uh, when they were young, I volunteered in the classrooms. I have been a volunteer in our son's Cub Scout and Boy Scout organizations. I've been a coach and a, a volunteer for the Eden Prairie Baseball Association, a volunteer for the Eden Prairie Football Association. I'm a member and active volunteer at our Eden Prairie Church. Uh, and I'm also a veteran. I served in the Army in Vietnam. My, uh, my background is in business. I was a senior manager in the logistics and operations area at Delhi Express right here in Eden Prairie on Highway 5 uh, for 27 years, up until just a few years ago. Uh, I served three terms on the Eden Prairie School Board and am honored now to serve as a state senator representing this community. In the last four years, I was elected by my peers to serve as the Senate Minority Leader and I am honored to do that. I'm running for election because our state faces great challenges, challenges in our economy, our tax code, our regulatory code, challenges in education and in health care. And I believe that my background and experiences have prepared me to provide the leadership our state needs to move forward. And I look forward to working with you in that effort, and I ask for your support in November. Thank you. Thank you. Lori. Well, thank you all for having us here this evening and for particip participating in this forum. In my opening, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who I am and why it is that I'm running. My husband, John, and I have lived in the district for 25 years. Our three children graduated from the Hopkins Public High School. They're married now, living in Minneapolis, and are starting <coughs> great careers. We are so fortunate to have four wonderful grandchildren. I'm running because I want every family, every generation, to have the same opportunities that my family had. I'm running because I care about our future. During those years when our kids were in school, I was a volunteer for a multitude of activities. I did booster groups and parent involvement teams. I also spent 19 years coaching a program that developed team-based problem-solving skills. The program was first called Odyssey of the Mind, later on Destination Imagination. Professionally, I worked as a communication consultant and a management analyst. The consulting I did was team-based problem solving. I worked with groups and organizations to identify the root cause of problems. I helped people be data-driven in their decisions. I worked with teams to build consensus and select out the best solutions available to them. I think these are skills we need in today's legislature. I think that we need to work together to use data to solve problems and not be divided by bitter partisanship. I think that we should build consensus instead of becoming further polarized. I, I'm Lori Pryor. I'm a mom. I'm a grandmother. I'm a problem solver. It's time to get the job done. We need to fix our we need to fix our roads and bridges. We need to get the job done in the legislature today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. Mary? Um, I'm Mary Shapiro, and I thank uh, the League of Women Voters for um, having this um, forum. Uh, I, um, I think a lot of my life experience has really prepared me for serving in the legislature because I understand a wide range of problems that people <coughs> struggle with. Um, first of all, I was raised in a single parent home. My mom was a widow with three small children. She had to work very hard at a low paying job and I had to grow up very fast. I often had to take care of my younger siblings. I also um, worked my way through the University of Minnesota. I worked as a nurse's aide in a um, nursing home and I there became acquainted with the issues of aging and uh, the problems of people with disabilities. 
Um, I got a BA in theater because I had an intention of going into show business, but when I figured out I couldn't make any money that way, I decided to pick up an English major and become a teacher. And I fell in love with the, fell in love with the job. I taught in Minneapolis for about 35 years, and um, I, it, Minneapolis can be a rough school sometimes, and I had a few rough assignments. So I understand very well the struggles that teachers go through in the classroom. I was an ESL teacher too, so I um, understand the problems that immigrants have. I've often, um, in my volunteer work, I, I tutored Somali students and in the Eden Prairie Library, and uh, the group that I work with received the Human Rights Award right here in the in the Eden Prairie City Council Chambers. Uh, I also understand the changing demographics and how that has affected um, affected the schools. I um, also understand very well the di issues of disability because my youngest daughter has Down syndrome. She's sitting right over there, and I. Um, my last two years teaching, I developed a theater program for students with disabilities. Um, and I, uh, the reason I'm running for office is because of my great concern for the struggles of the ordinary working middle class family. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Jennifer Loon. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Loon. I'm the current state representative for District 48B. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters uh, for organizing this forum and all those who took the time to attend tonight. Eighteen years ago, my husband Doug and I chose Eden Prairie as our home. Our girls were educated here in the public schools. Uh, Erica graduated in 2011 and Rachel in 2015. We fell in love with this community and we have poured our volunteer time into helping ensure that this is an outstanding place for anyone to live, work, raise a family, and retire. I continue to be active as a STRIVE mentor at the Eden Prairie High School, a Rotarian, a member of the Eden Prairie Chamber of Commerce, and as a board member for CROP. My priorities are the same ones that Eden Prairie residents communicate to me every day. They want a thriving economy with good jobs, excellent schools, safe neighborhoods, affordable health care, and elected officials that are careful with their taxpayer dollars. Before running for office, I spent 16 years in both the public and private sectors, working on promoting healthy small businesses and job creation. And I put this experience to work uh, successfully uh, at the state capitol, changing unnecessary laws and regulations. My sponsorship of the taproom law has spurred over 9,000 new jobs in a booming craft beer industry here in Minnesota. This session, I authored an innovative program called the MinVest, which uh, harnesses uh, the power of crowdfunding so that individuals can invest in small businesses and receive an equity share for that investment, helping businesses raise capital. As a longtime supporter of our schools and a passionate advocate for the education of our children, I am now honored to be chairing the House Education Finance Committee. And this year, I'm proud that we crafted a bipartisan bill that puts more money in every K-12 classroom in the state and advance numerous reforms to help close the achievement gap, including early education scholarships, before and after school tutoring, and many other initiatives, while emphasizing parental choice, accountability, and local control. I value the trust that the voters have placed in me, and I've worked hard to be a good listener, a consensus builder, and a problem solver. I thank you, and I, I look forward to the debate tonight. Thank you, and just for clarity, that was Jennifer. Um, Ben Sherlock. Thank you. My name is Ben Sherlock, and I am so glad to be here tonight. I'm also so glad to see a full council chamber tonight. So thank you all for coming, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting on this forum. <coughs> I am a product of Eden Prairie Schools. Uh, my family moved here when I was just six years old, and I went up through Cedar Ridge, then Oak Point, then CMS, and finally EPHS. And I am currently a senior at the University of Minnesota, working on my political science degree. I have also worked in the community since high school. Uh, since 2010, I have taught karate and jiu-jitsu at Metro Karate and Jiu-Jitsu in Eden Prairie. I also developed a uh, kids' leadership program there. Uh, we teach kids active listening, people skills, how to speak, and how to problem solve and resolve conflicts. Um, the main reason I'm running is because I have a vision for a government that places I have a vision of a government that places people over politics and policy over petty squabbles. And 
the reason I was inspired to run to was my grandfather. He, uh, he, he died a few years back, but he, he told me that we make our government, and the only way that we can see the change we want is to do it ourselves and make it happen. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. All right, we'll um, go to our first question. And the first question, um, we're gonna kind of reverse our order and so Ben, you'll be answering this question first. So, um, and we have many topics to, to choose from this evening. I think I can see a lot of passion behind the questions here. So um, I hope to be able to at least um, on several different topics here. So the first question this evening is, what should be done with any state and budget surplus? If you support tax cuts, how would you recommend that they be implemented? Thank you. Um, I believe, first and foremost, the surplus should go towards education, especially early childhood education. I believe early childhood education is the number one way that we can solve the achievement gap. I also believe that a portion of the surplus should be put into a rainy day fund to make sure that next time the economy goes for a downturn, we aren't in as much trouble as we were before. Um, by having that money ready to go, we will be ready to face whatever challenges uh, come with the economy because the economy does go in cycles. We have great times, bullish times, but then it always gets worse again. But if we prepare this time, we will be ready to face it. Thank you. Jennifer Loom. Thank you. Um, well, I do think uh, with the surplus that we have, and it's roughly $800 million currently um, in the state budget, that we should be returning some of that money to Minnesota families. Um, uh, we are collecting more than we need, and uh, for every dollar that we take out, that means more is coming out of those families who are struggling to maybe save for retirement, help their children go to college, or other necessities uh, that they need. Um, you know, there are some really important things in the tax bill that was proposed and unfortunately was not signed into law that would help our families, uh, an increased dependent care tax credit for families struggling with the cost of daycare, and also a nation-leading credit for uh, people paying student loan debt. So for students with debt, you could get a tax credit for some of those payments, which would certainly help uh, our young people off to a good start. So I do think that would be a good way to start. Um, and building on our historic investments in early childhood, I think there is room to do both both of those things. Thank you, Jennifer. Mary. Mary Shapiro. I also think that um, the surplus should be given back to the families in Minnesota. And it shows me that obviously they are being taxed too high, too high a rate. I know Minnesota has one of the highest tax rates in the country, and uh, that really takes away takes away um, resources from from families who um, would want to save for retirement or educate their children and um, other things they need. Also, the um, cost of insurance, health insurance, is absolutely skyrocketing. And that's another um, cost that uh, Minnesota families have to bear. Thank you, Mary. Lori Pryor. Well, I, I also noted that uh, the tax bill was not uh, passed into law. Um, there was an error, and so there was a pocket veto. And there was a couple things in that tax cut bill that I definitely agree with. One of them was that there was a tax cut um, for property taxes for small businesses. And this is something that really matters to our economy. So um, I think that in the future with our surplus, that's something that we need to revisit and look at. I also think that the tax credits to our young families that are paying for childcare, uh, I think that was an important tax cut that we that we should also take a look at um, um, bring, bringing forward again. And I can tell, you know, when I'm going door to door talking to people, I talk to so many young families and they are struggling and they're struggling with the cost of daycare, and they're trying to also save for their kids' college education while they're paying the cost of the college education um, with these child care costs. So um, I, I think that there are some cuts that we need to make, but I also think we need to catch up on our investments, like investments in education. Thank you, Lori. David Hand. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we do have a surplus currently, but we also have a law that, that says that if any surplus exists after the February forecast, one third of that automatically goes into our reserve accounts. So we are building reserves, 
Uh, I think there's a question of how, how much we build them as we go forward. Uh, but I think that uh, what this shows is that we have a tax policy that is uh, more than we need. We had some historic tax increases in the last four years. And I think that uh, we need to think about how we can return some of that tax money to businesses and people in this state. Uh, we need to grow our economy. We need to rejuvenate the investment in our state. And some of the policies we have on taxation and regulation have been detrimental to that. So I think that uh, there are a lot of things we can do, a lot of things we have done, uh, but we've seen our state spending budget grow by almost 50% in the last decade. And I think that we ought to look at how we can do things to get our economy going again. I think part of that is related to returning some of the tax collection we've made back to the economy. Thank you, David. Steve Swazinski. Well, nice problem to have, uh, that we have a surplus. And it's uh, through hard work by the legislature and the governor that we were able to have a surplus. The word duty is found twice in the Minnesota State Constitution. And the first time it's mentioned is in Article 8, and it, where it reads, the stability of a democracy dependent upon the intelligence of the people, it is the duty of the legislature to create a general and uniform system of public schools. If we've got a surplus, I would argue it's the duty of the legislature to invest that money in the people and our precious, the most precious people in this state are our children. So let's put the money back into the schools and um, do well. <laughs> Thank you. For our next question, we will start with David Hand followed by Lori Pryor. And so another Cost, cost question. This one has to do with the cost of child care. The cost of child care has skyrocketed in, skyrocketed in recent years, and quality care is out of reach for most families. Minnesota <coughs> is ranked the least affordable state for center based infant care and the fifth worst for four year old <coughs> care. 1197 a month for infants and 900 six dollars a month for age four what will you do to improve access and availability to quality and affordable child care for working families well thank you we do have uh, I think uh, some challenges facing child care that's a, it's a big need uh, but uh, it, it is a, a problem that I don't know that we can entirely solve by just dedicating more money into a child care program if you will uh, I think that, that if we do things like provide scholarships or grants to, to individuals as they look for choices, that is the best way to solve this. Let's, let's find people who have a need uh, and support them directly rather than trying to find ways to subsidize existing programs. I don't think that our job is to pick and choose which programs are, are the right ones for families. Let's let people decide where they need to take their kids and if they need help economically to make that work, I think we can do that through a tax policy and uh, grants for uh, direct help. Thank you. Lori? Well, I, as I mentioned before, um, this, is a, uh, this is an issue that I have a very strong personal connection to because I do have four grandchildren and both of those have, well, all of the grandchildren have two working parents. And so they need, they've needed infant care, they need um, preschool, and they're paying these high costs of quality childcare. Now, as I said before, our families had great opportunities. Um, they are able to afford quality um, childcare, and they're making the sacrifices to make sure that they're affording, uh, they can pay for this high quality childcare. And <laughs> I'm looking at my son, that's, you know, holes in the shoes, whatever it takes, but her, you know, their child has good quality childcare. And we need, as David suggested, we need to keep making sure that we're targeting so that the families that are being left behind and that are not able to afford quality child care, that we, we're targeting them and we find a way to help them, whether it's through tax credits or, or you know, programs that, that do support schools. Thank you, Lori. Mary Shapiro. Boy, do I understand that problem. Um, both my husband and I worked uh, in Minneapolis Public Schools we had small children. And so we faced the problem of finding quality daycare and affordable daycare as well. Um, also with um, uh, Toba's disability, we had to find a, a special place that could um, 
work with her, her special needs. Uh, I think that for families who are struggling financially, we should um, pr probably have a, give them a tax credit or some sort of scholarship to, um, to help them to, to pay their daycare expenses. And also, growing up in a family with a single mother and um, having to take care of younger siblings when I was very young, like nine or 10 years old, uh, I think um, single mothers should, should have a priority too in um, those scholarships for their children. Thank you, Mary. Jennifer Boom. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll try not to repeat what's already been said because I think we've acknowledged that it, it is a problem. And um, uh, in the question regarding um, tax cuts and what should be done with the surplus, uh, as I mentioned, one of those provisions in the tax bill that unfortunately the governor uh, saw to fit to veto was an expansion of the dependent care tax credit. Uh, Minnesota's state tax credit um, does not mirror the federal credit, and so a lot of our families are at a disadvantage. Only very, very low income people are able to get any kind of a tax credit from the state currently for their dependent care expenses. We need to expand that uh, for lower up to middle class families. Um, I think the provision in the tax bill would have helped families up through maybe 76000 a year in, in annual income. Um, we can also provide scholarships as we do currently um, for uh, three and four year olds, but also families with younger children uh, that get a preschool scholarship. Their, their younger children can um, receive a scholarship as well. And that's been very helpful some, for some low income families in Minnesota and should be continued. Thank you. Ben Sherlock. When I was young, both my parents worked, which meant my sister and I were taken care of by the child care. We went to the Y at Cedar Ridge. Um, I, I think it's with so many families having both parents working, nobody to stay home and take care of the kids, it's more important than ever that we target the families who need this the most. I think it's absolutely unacceptable that we rank so poorly, and I think we need to do better. So I agree with uh, many of my colleagues here that we need to be targeting the families, like single mothers and at need families who need childcare the most with tax credits, with scholarships, and everything we can do. Thank you, Ben. And Steve Switzinski. I think the hardest thing uh, a candidate or a representative could ever hear is to meet some young couple and for them to say to um, you, I don't know if we can afford to have children because of the high cost of daycare. And those words, I, I can't imagine in living in a day and age when we go door knocking and you hear the words, everybody's talking about the high price of college, the high price of college, and then you end up going to a door when they say the, the, the high price of, of daycare. And this is a conundrum for us right now because we don't pay our daycare providers what they should get paid and we complain already about the high cost of it. So this is maybe a problem that's, um, whoever asked that question, I applaud you because it is a complicated issue. And the important thing for us to do as representatives is to make sure we put all options on the table because we gotta figure this issue out. And we will, because we always do get things right eventually, but let's talk about this and get it at the forefront of the debate. Thank you, Steve. All right, on to our third question. Um, and we will start with Jennifer Bloom, followed by Mary Shapiro. So we'll go backwards. Uh, since more and more money is being um, thrown into education, um, it still has not closed the achievement gap. It has not increased graduation rates. It has not shown demonstrable improvements in academic proficiency statewide. What is your answer to improve education in Minnesota? Thank you, it's a really good question and it's something I spent a lot of time um, studying and working on uh, in the legislature. Um, you know, there is no silver bullet to uh, closing the achievement gap. Um, we've done a lot to examine the problem, try to identify some of the factors and look at how we can help. But um, I think one thing we know for sure is that for disadvantaged children, that achievement gap starts very early. Uh, it starts uh, when children are babies uh, and they're born into poverty. And um, many times they don't have the uh, opportunities for, for quality early childhood learning and, and things that all of us take for granted that we probably did with our children, reading to your children, singing to them, developing language at an early age. 
So we've made some strides in terms of improving those opportunities for children who need it. Uh, we've also worked on um, expanding um, before and after school programs at our school. It's called extended time revenue, so schools can spend more time with struggling students. Um, I also piloted a project this year on mentorship, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, which really uh, is shown to help um, students who need it. So there's many initiatives we started. We're studying um, the results of those, and uh, I am hopeful that we can begin to make strides in closing that achievement gap. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, I worked in the middle of the achievement gap in Minneapolis, and uh, I can tell you that there's a lot of waste in how schools spend their money. Um, for example, we will one year we had one reading program, and uh, a year or two later they decided to throw it out and buy all new books, and then you have to train all the teachers, and it just didn't seem to make any difference. Also, there's just you know, there's just factors that are way out of our control. Like, I had many students who, there's no father at home. And um, there's also, they also have siblings that are fathered by different fathers. There's just, uh, they live in chaotic situations. And also teaching ESL, um, my kids didn't speak English. I had to start with, I had to start from scratch with them. And, and so, you know, these are, these are just things that we struggled with in the inner city and also, we have to do something about classroom discipline because the teachers are not being supported in that way. And I don't feel that teachers should be doing crowd control. We should be teaching. And uh, so we need a lot of support in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Pryor. Well, as I said in my introduction, I'm a problem solver. And the first thing you do when you're trying to solve a problem is you make sure that you have good information. One thing that uh, we've done in the state now is that they're talking about de-aggregating <coughs> data so that we can really target in and figure out who are the children that are falling behind and we can describe what kind of situations they're living in and know who they are. And once we know who we're targeting to um, bring up, uh, close the achievement gap, then we can better direct our resources. And that's what you do in problem solving. All right, there's a couple things that we know right now. One of them is that um, we need, the children that are falling behind are most likely from homes that are living in poverty. So the first thing we need to do if we want to help the child is stabilize the homes. A homeless child cannot learn. A hungry child cannot learn. These are issues that we can work with. The other thing that we know right now is that early childhood does make a difference. So as we were talking about the early childhood programs, we need to look to those to close the achievement gap. Thank you. David Han. Uh, this is a, a good question. This may be one of the more important questions that we face as a state. Education, I think, is maybe the most important thing we do. It's the reason I got involved in politics in the first place. Uh, but this is not a question of money. Uh, our state budget, K-12 education, E-12 education, is 42% of the budget. It is the single largest thing we spend money on, and it's been that way for decades. And the problem of achievement and the results uh, we've seen this problem uh, for as long as I've been in the legislature. I call it the problem that we love to admire, but we don't do a lot to change it. And so if it's not a question of money, what is it a question of? And there are a lot of great schools, a lot of very successful schools. I've been associated with some of them, uh, charter schools and others. And I think what it really comes down to is empowering local schools, local school boards to do things that make sense and be held accountable to the parents that they serve. There's not a silver bullet, as Jennifer said. We're not going to have a state policy or a federal policy that's going to fix this. But we have to trust teachers, we have to trust administrators, we have to trust local boards, and we have to change the policies of the state to enable that to happen. Thank you, David. <coughs> the achievement gap, or what I prefer to you call it, the opportunity gap is a problem in this state. That's why the question came up. And I think the two things we can do is we need to empower the parents and empower the kids. And I think Governor Dayton uh, earlier this year took a step in the right direction when he started finding money to fund pre-K. So we can get these kids starting out on equal footing um, when they start kindergarten. And the other thing we can do right now, we're 46th in the nation in student counselor ratios. And we can improve that number. We can make us in the top 10 if we just find the money. When kids go to the counselor because they're struggling in school and the counselors tell them that we can't meet with you today, that that's a problem. And we can solve this problem and by improving the student to counselor ratio in our schools. And I applaud Governor Dayton's attempt to fund pre-K education. 
Thank you, Steve. And Ben Sherlock. Like I was saying earlier, pre-K education is crucial towards solving the achievement gap, making sure that children are educated early in childhood and get used to school settings and get used to working with teachers. Also, it's important that we look at this issue as not just an educational issue, but also as a family issue and as a community issue. We need schools to be looking at families and working with those families to find out those students' individual needs. I believe, like Steve said, having more counselors, having counselors who have resources to work with students is absolutely crucial towards solving the achievement gap. Thank you. Our fourth question. Um, we will be starting with Lori Pryor, followed by Mary Shapiro. Racial disparities in Minnesota include home ownership, small business development, education, health care, and incarceration. Last year, Governor Dayton and the legislator provided additional funding for small business development and first-time home buyers. What, um, if elected, will you support additional funding to address racial disparities? And what efforts, excuse, and what other efforts will you uh, support to reduce racial disparity? Well, I think I'll start by saying that I think the approach that was started in the last session to talk about economic disparities is the way to approach this. And what we want to keep coming back to is jobs. And we want to make sure the programs that we have right now to help people find employment, we want to make sure that they're in the neighborhoods um, where people are unemployed and um, the neighborhoods where, where we have people of color and where we see the racial disparities. And the other part um, of this too is to make sure that it stays local, that it stays neighborhood, because the people that live there um, know what the issues are and they also know where the opportunities are and they also need to see that, um, that there is a community around them that's going to support them um, in the change and to support them on an ongoing way to make the change um, to, to close this gap in, in um, economic disparities. So I, I do follow the, the governor's plan and I think it is an economic issue first. Thank you. Mary Shapiro. Well, I think the um, racial disparity problem starts um, way back with uh, education because uh, everything hinges on education. I think that um, we have to sort of think of other possibilities for um, children's education. Uh, for example, not everybody is going to be college bound. Uh, some people are good with their, working with their hands and I think we have to, um, you know, put more effort into vocational education too. Also, um, we need to, I, thought, I think apprenticeships would be good. Uh, maybe have small business owners come in and there, you know, there's a lot of creative kids who have a difficult time sitting still in a classroom, but they're very creative and uh, if they could um, have mentors um, and, and maybe um, have an apprenticeship with uh, some sort of small business. I, I just think we have to think of, of other solutions for kids. Thank you, Mary. Jennifer Moon. Well, I would agree with uh, Mary's point about education. It all starts with making sure that every child in Minnesota is educated to their greatest potential. And too many of our, our children of color are falling uh, through the cracks and into that achievement or opportunity gap that we discussed in a previous question. So um, for a lot of, of Minnesota's children, which may be in inner city, perhaps Minneapolis or St. Paul in particular, uh, there are many schools there with just really poor, poor track records in terms of, of educational attainment for those children. I think we do need to do some significant turnaround in those schools. Um, again, allowing innovation to take place for the parents to take more control over their schools, unleash the innovation of the teachers and the parents together to make sure that those children succeed. Uh, we should not allow any children to fall behind. Um, there's been some strides through some um, entities like Northside Achievement Zone and that, which really brings <coughs> into, um, all services, including job training and that, into the neighborhoods uh, of North Minneapolis, which need it. And those are some other things to look at for um, um, furthering that, that cause and that effort. Thank you, Jennifer. Ben Sherlock. I think one of the most important jobs of a legislator is to listen. And in our communities, we have plenty of organizations that have been working on racial disparities, studying them, working on solutions, 
And so a legislator should sit down with each and every one of these organizations and find out what they've been seeing, what they've been hearing, and what they've been doing, and how the legislator can help. Also, I think that education is vital. I think solving the achievement gap will go a long way towards solving our racial disparities. Thank you, Ben. Steve Swidzinski. Well, it's all, with respect to this issue, it's education, education, education. I've seen firsthand the racial disparity issue in Eden Prairie, and it's, um, it's not okay. And so I think, as Ben said, the best thing we can do is empower these kids to want to stay in school, to want to better their lives, and to try to achieve the American dream. And it's a really tough issue. The whole Black Lives Matter movement is it's all about racial disparities and feeling, part, feeling like you're not part of something larger than yourself. And so how can we bring people that don't feel like they're part of the American dream, bring them into this thing called America so that they feel as though they're part of the puzzle that we're all trying to solve? And Thank wish us all luck on that one. Thank you, Steve. And David Hand. I hate to sound like a broken record, but education really is the key to this disparity issue. Uh, our, our minority students in our state, our graduation rates in the state are among the lowest in the country for minority kids. Our basic skill achievement scores are among the lowest in the country in Minnesota. Uh, we, if we can't solve this, if people aren't able to graduate from high school with basic skills, how can we expect them to be gainfully employed, how can we expect them? How can we expect to solve this disparity issue if we're not able to solve that problem? And it has been a persistent problem. It goes back to not how much money we spend, but how we govern schools, how who makes decisions, what kind of things can we try, what kind of things when, we, when they succeed can we implement. There are a lot of very successful schools in the state, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, across the state. The difficulty has been we have not been able to replicate that, and I think that is a structural problem in education, and we can solve it if we have the political will to do it. Thank you. Our fifth question, we'll start with Mary Shapiro, followed by Lori Pryor. Currently, under Minnesota law, individuals who have been convicted of a felony do not have the right to vote until they're finished with parole or probation. At least 47,000 Minnesotans, disproportionately people of color, are barred from voting. If elected, will you support legislation to restore voting rights for individuals who are on parole or probation? Uh, I don't know. I think that would have to be done on a, a, an individual basis. What was the severity of the crime? Has the person um, uh, served sufficient time for the crime? Has um, have they been? Um, oh, have have they have they learned? Uh, I don't know. It, it. I think it really depends on a case by case basis. Thank you, Mary. Lori Pryor. Well, I know that states vary on when they um, return voting rights to people that have been convicted of a, of a crime, a felony, and have served time, um, and then been released, though, because they, they, they did their time. You know, they paid for their crime um, in jail, in prison. Um, and so some states, when you're released from prison, it's really clear you're out of prison. You did your, you, you did your time, you, you were released. And then that means that you're, you're out there, you're trying to re rejoin society. You're on probation, and, and so if things go wrong, you'll be back in jail, and you have to meet the terms of probation. But it's clear that a person has served their time, served their debt to society, because they're out of jail. And so other states have given those people that have served their time, paid their debt, they put them on the path towards, on the path towards re returning to society as full citizens. They say that's the mark that we note, is that you're out of jail, and, they're, and they, they give them their voting rights again. So I think it is something we should look at. Thank you, Lori. David Han. 
There has been some debate in the legislature about this issue. Currently, our state law, if you are convicted of a felony, you do lose some of your civil rights, including the right to vote. Uh, and those rights are restored when you complete your sentence. Uh, but in Minnesota, we don't require that the sentence be served in jail. There are many who are released from jail and, and are serving part of their sentence under probation. And the current law says that until you finish that probationary period, you're not eligible to have your rights, your voting rights restored. So there has been some debate about this issue. There have been a couple of bills that have been discussed. I think it is a problem that uh, is not clear what the answer is. I think there are reasons on both sides to to keep the system as it is currently, and there are arguments to say maybe we ought to try and modify it in some degree. Uh, but I think this is a, this is one of those issues that would benefit from further debate in the legislature. I expect we will have it. Thank you, David. Steve Swatinsky. <coughs> um, I'm so proud to teach American history and American government, and one of the things I love talking about is the expansion of suffrage and the 15th Amendment giving African American men the right to vote, and the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote, and the 26th Amendment giving our 18, 19, 20 year olds the right to vote. And I think disenfranchising people is a stain upon American democracy. I don't know if I can look my students in the eye and say, well this is why we took the right a vote away from this person when everything we've been about as a nation is expanding rights and expanding suffrage and so I to answer the question um, yeah I am all in favor of restoring the right to franchise to convicted felons after they've repaid their debt to society thank you Steve Ben Sherlock like Steve, I'm also in favor of restoring the right to vote to convicted felons, even when they're on probation. Part of probation is helping people get reintegrated into society after they've served their time, after they've paid their dues for their crime. I think voting rights, I think the right to vote is one of the most important rights that we have as Americans, and part of getting people to feel like citizens again is giving them <coughs> access to that most important right. Thank you, Ben. Jennifer Loon. Well, um, this is an, an interesting and I think an, an issue that we have discussed somewhat at the legislature and wrestled with. And um, I think uh, for me, making sure that our our voting system is clear and fair and um, you know, identifying and, and knowing who is eligible to vote and who is not is an important um, factor in making sure that people feel confident in our elections. Um, I think, you know, as um, with some um, sentences in that, people may be being released for if prisons are overcrowded and that, we're trying to alleviate some of that. Um, people may be spending more time in probation or less time serving their sentence uh, in prison. Um, and I think I would just need to study this a little more to know what the other implications would be for changing the law this time. Thank you. Our next question. We'll start with Mary Shapiro, followed by Jennifer Moon. <coughs> Currently, 40% of guns sold in Minnesota are sold without any background checks <clears throat> through gun sales, private sales, and on online sales. Polls show a majority of Minnesotans support background checks for all gun sales. Would you support legislation to close the loopholes and require background checks for all the gun sales? If not, why? Well, this is difficult because we have we do have a Second Amendment which guarantees the right to bear arms, but we also have to balance it with um, public safety. Uh, I would be in favor of legislation that works, and I'm not quite sure whether universal background checks is something that would really work. Uh, I know that um, people who are law-abiding citizens would go along with it. They would um, go through the background checks if they're buying a gun from a neighbor or um, wherever. But uh, I don't think criminals will do the same thing. And I think, um, I mean, if they get a gun from somebody, they're not going to go through the through the background check. They're just, uh, I don't see how it would really help. I think I would have to look into it a little more. Thank you, Mary. Jennifer Loon? Thank you. Well, uh, again, this is a topic that I think has, has come in some form before the legislature or been discussed. And certainly with 
um, some recent um, really tragic um, gun violence incidences, this is something that is, is worthy of debate. Again, as, as someone who um, values our constitutional rights, I think any, any infringement upon that has to be carefully examined and balanced to make sure that we are not infringing on, on the law-abiding <coughs> citizens' rights to, uh, to keep and bear arms. Um, but is, is this something that would reasonably uh, help to try to stem gun violence? Um, you know, I think unfortunately some of the incidences that we've heard of are people that have, have purchased guns already going through a background check and, and things weren't identified in their past. And um, we also have a, a significant problem uh, with mental health that have contributed to many of these things. So um, I don't think it's a, a, a panacea. Uh, to the gun violence that we've seen in our country, and we need to look at a broader range of solutions. Thank you, Jennifer. Ben Sherlock. Let me be clear. I fully support the Second Amendment. I also believe that the safety and security of our families is one of the most important jobs of a legislator. With the majority of Americans supporting universal background checks, I think it's disappointing that we haven't made it happen yet. It's such a common-sense solution, and I am fully in favor of universal background checks. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Please hold your applause. Steve Swazinski. As an educator, I can tell you the worst day in any teacher's life is when they have to walk into the classroom and say, we had another Ricori today or another Red Lake or Sandy Hook or Columbine. And the looks on those students' faces is indescribable. It's like they have this blank look on their faces of, why aren't you adults doing something about this? How come you guys keep dropping the ball on this? We shouldn't have to live like this in fear. Or what, I can't even describe the words that would, I can't even, I don't even know the words that would describe to you what it's like to look at that classroom of 30 faces and, have, and for me to have to explain that. In Minnesota, it's against the law to possess a switchblade. I don't know what the problem is for banning assault weapons like the AR-15. Universal background checks, let's just get it done. And for our kids' well-being, this is our future. Our kids, and they're screaming at us to solve this problem. Thank you, Steve. David Hand. Uh, this is an issue that we had some debate in the legislature, and it's been a bipartisan debate, frankly. There are Democrats and Republicans who have some concern about this as a way to solve the problem of gun violence. Uh, Law-abiding citizens who own guns are not the problem, are not the reason why we have the difficulties we have. Uh, so I think uh, to, to say we want to implement a universal requirement to background check every gun sale does raise some practical problems that may make it difficult even to implement much less will it would have any effect on solving this problem that we see. Uh, certainly there are issues with mental health and trying to make sure that, that uh, we are keeping people with uh, mental health problems from having access to uh, dangerous weapons of any kind is a big part of the problem. We need to do a better job of that. But this is not the thing that is going to solve the problem. Thank you, David. Lori Pryor. Well, as I said before, I'm a problem solver. And a problem solver looks at data. There is available data on whether or not universal background checks work. And I must say right now that this is a difference between me and my opponent. I am supporting universal background checks. In 18 states, there are universal background checks. These background checks do not infringe on Second Amendment rights. Law-abiding citizens are buying guns in these 18 states. But what it has done is kept some guns out of the wrong hands. And those hands that they're keeping the guns away from, lives are being saved. There are 46% fewer women shot to death by their intimate part partners. There are 48% fewer law enforcement officers killed by handguns. We also are reducing illegal gun trafficking. So we have found that universal background checks work because it's being done in other states. I support it. Thank you. For our next question, question seven, we are going to start with Lori Pryor, followed by David Hand. If passed, the CHEER Act would be Minnesota's answer to the Supreme Court's Hobby Lobby contraception coverage decision. CHEER would ensure that Minnesota health plans offering drug coverage would include contraceptives with an exception for religious institutions. 
If elected, would you support the CHEER Act? Why or why not? Well, here I'm going to talk about my experience talking to voters. I mean, I go, I've been spending all spring, all summer, into the fall now, going door to door talking to people. And um, a lot of times I'll come up to a door and I'll talk to, usually it's a one wo young woman, but often it's a middle-aged woman, it's even older women. And what they talk to me about is they want to make sure that their rights are being protected and their basic health care rights are being protected. And what they perceive is that it's being under attack right now. And so they've asked me to stand up and support women's rights to basic health care. And I think the CHEER Act goes a long way towards doing that, so I would support it. Thank you, Lori. David Han. Uh, well, to be quite honest with you, I've not heard of the CHEER Act before tonight. I don't really know what uh, the provisions of it are or what it does, uh, so I can't tell you whether I would support it or not. So I think I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, David. Steve Swazinski. The Hobby Lobby Law, Hobby Lobby Law. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> The use of contraceptives, reproductive freedom is, is health care. And I would be in favor of any uh, getting reproductive freedom and contraceptives in the hands of people that want to control their destiny and when they're ready to have children. And that's a right under the health care, um, the Affordable Care Act, and I just would like to see that continue for women in this country and men. Thank you, Steve. Ben Sherlock. Another part of a legislator's job is protecting women's health care rights, not infringing upon them. I would support the CHEER Act. I think the Hobby Lobby decision was a terrible decision, and I think that with so many women using contraceptives for so many different reasons, it's not our business to tell them yes or no, it's between them and their doctors. And I want to keep it that way. Thank you, Ben. Jennifer Loon. Thank you. <clears throat> well, and I have not heard of the CHEER Act, or maybe just not the acronym for it, but um, I, um, you know, I think, you know, obviously um, we want people to be able to uh, decide when they are ready to have children, and I think um, contraceptive is, is part of that. But the concern I have with mandates on the provision of any particular uh, types of drugs or procedures in healthcare is that Minnesota is a state that has a number of mandates, one of the highest number of mandates on its health insurance provisions, and that has led to escalating um, costs of insurance policies, making it unaffordable and out of the reach of many families and people who purchase on the individual insurance market. So, um, you know, I just think that needs to be a factor considered whenever we decide to add more mandates to particular coverage um, and whether or not that is something that can continue that escalation of, of health insurance premiums. Thank you, Jennifer. Mary Shapiro. Well, I don't think women are denied access to um, contraceptives. I, I have never heard of the CHEER Act, but we also have to balance, um, you know, religious sensibilities with um, with the um, having to pay for um, certain, like certain religious organizations, for example, like uh, Little Sisters of the Poor. Little Sisters of the Poor had to go to the Supreme Court in order to be able to um, not have to pay for um, the the birth control of employees. Well, the employees still have access to, to birth control, but um, why, why make a Catholic organization pay for something that goes against its religious beliefs? And uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor, I mean, these are women that dedicate their lives to taking care of the um, elderly, the poor elderly, and I just think that we should um, respect the religious sensibilities of um, religious organizations in that manner. Thank you, Mary. Our next question, we'll start with Jennifer Loon, followed by Ben Sherlock. Due to 40 years of failed federal policy, there is a backlog of tens of thousands of untested chemicals with which the EPA has recently been given authority to test but at a rate of only 20 chemicals at a time. What do you think the role of the state should be when the federal government is slow to act on chemical threats to public health? 
Well, um, you know, I guess I'm not familiar with that, the specifics of the first part of the question and the federal EPA, but I do know that, you know, Minnesota's Pollution Control Agency, the MPCA, and the Department of Health um, do and have done um, research into chemicals of concern, um, specifically chemicals that are of concern uh, for children. That's legislation that uh, we have passed in the legislature and have spent some time debating and discussing. So I think certainly the states have an important role in protecting their citizens and making sure that the air and the water uh, are safe and that we are aware of what's in the environment around us. So um, I think our Minnesota generally does a very good job in that area um, and does a good job protecting its citizens. Thank you. Ben Sherlock. One of the most important roles of state legislators is protecting our citizens and our environment. If, as the question asked, the federal government seems too slow to act, we need to pick up the slack. Um, I'm not sure if this is talking about polluting chemicals or volatile chemicals right now, but either one is dangerous and either one is something we need to be taking care of and paying attention to. Thank you. Steve Swazinski. I read recently that the Food and, Drug, Food and Drug Administration has only tested 200 synthetic chemicals out of, out of the thousands of chemicals that we have produced in recent years. And one of the reasons I'm running for state senate is I'm tired of the gridlock and the dysfunction and the partisan politics going on in Washington, D.C. And I think over the next 10, 20 years in America, in uh, the real work is going to be getting done in the states and what I call the laboratories of democracy. And states are already taking, moving, taking steps forward in actions that the federal government is dropping the ball on. And so this is a clear example of why I want to be a state senator. Because if the federal government is not going to do the work that we send them to Washington, D.C. to do, let's do it in the states and set, set examples to the rest of the country. Thank you, Steve. David Ham. Well, I think uh, all of us want to have assurances that the water is safe clean and that the things that we're dealing with are our state products. Uh, we do have uh, organizations implemented at the federal government level to try to give us those assurances and they do it in a very rigorous way. I think it's true, I don't know the specifics of the premise of the question, I think it is true that sometimes these federal bureaucracies get more uh, work than they can handle and so things may get, uh, may get backlogged. I'm not sure that the answer to that is for the states to say, well, we'll come in and we'll decide to do it on our own. I don't know that we are prepared to build the kind of infrastructure to make those decisions. So I think that uh, to the extent that there are these problems at the federal level, I think we need to put pressure on the federal government, our representatives there, to make sure they do it in a streamlined way, and I think they can do that. I know one thing that, oh, I'm sorry, was it me? Okay. <laughs> yeah, Lori Pryor. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so, you know, this is one of these issues that hits close to home. Um, we, I think a lot of us read the other day the article that talked about toxins in our houses that's in the dust. And as I'm reading this article, I'm, I'm, I'm watching my one-year-old grandson crawl, around the crawl across the floor, pick up an optic and stick his hand in his mouth, and I'm thinking about the toxins that he just put in his mouth. Um, so I think what the question is addressing is, we, um, there are a number of, of toxins that are suspected of being dangerous, but there's a backlog where they're not being banned yet. And so can the state do something right now um, to do something about this, this slow before some, the, this, the, the slow time it takes before something's being banned? And I think what we can do is we can educate and we can bring some transparency to suspected toxins. So as a state, maybe we're not going to ban them, but we can probably get out there with stronger education about things that are being suspected of, of, to of being toxics, and I think there's some good legislation that's going to advance that. Thank you, Lori. And Mary Shapiro. Well, um, one thing I know is that many com companies that are working with chemicals and produce things that could be toxic do have... Um, uh, scientists uh, that work for the company. In fact, uh, one of my good friends is an environmental scientist who worked for LifeTouch, and his job was to make sure that um, the company abided by all the EPA regulations. So I, I think um, that companies, a lot of companies do take care of that, uh, but um, again, um, I, the legislature has to watch out and make sure that our air and water is clean. 
Thank you. Our next question, we'll start with David Hand, started, um, followed by Steve Swazinski. Are you in favor of reinstating the Citizens Advisory Committee that had input on environmental issues? Uh, this, uh, there was a Citizens Advisory Committee that uh, was a, a body that gave advice to the Minnesota PCA, and it was uh, discontinued in the recent legislation. And it was done so because there were some problems with the authority and the scope of that body. Um, we do have a group of, uh, of experts, if you will, scientists who are qualified to make decisions on these matters. And in, in the way this body was constituted in Minnesota, it allowed the citizen group to override that body. Uh, I don't think that is a great way to do governance, and it did create some problems. You know, companies, businesses that do work in Minnesota need to know that there is a regulatory structure that is uh, not going to change on them, and that is rational and understandable, and in fact was adopted by the legislature. So I think. Uh, having the citizen group with some uncertainty in that process. Uh, so I think if you do bring something like that back, you may have to do something to make sure that the scope of that organization does not override uh, the ways that the legislature has put in place to govern these issues. Thank you, David. Steve Swazinski. The Citizens Advisory Committee was established um, to make sure that our environment is safe, which could be argued as the number one purpose of government because without water we die and without clean and healthy water we die and the citizens advisory committee was I believe established by the governor in order to ensure that our water and air was safe for us and regulations on businesses are an issue they just are and it's a balance in the democracy in government, but I think we should always err on the side of clean air, clean water, safe working conditions over um, anything else we might want to look at. But uh, all options with respect to the Citizens Advisory Committee, I understand the problems with it, that it's a non-elected um, body, and I get that, but let's err on the side of clean water and clean air. Thank you, Steve. Ben Sherlock. I do support the Citizens Advisory Committee. I think it's important that we have as many people involved as we possibly can because every single one of us either benefits or loses out because of the environment. And I also think it's very important that experts have a say. I think the Citizens Advisory Committee should be made up of experts, citizens, families, academics, all kinds of different people from different walks of life who have different knowledge and experience and have different things that they can contribute and give advice on about our environment. Thank you. Jennifer Lillen. Well, the Citizens Advisory Committee was actually, our council was started in 1967. And that was before the federal EPA was created, uh, long before Minnesota had a Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, many other um, entities that have been put in place to really study and regulate chemicals um, and things to ensure that we're not polluting air and water, both from the federal and the state level. So since that time, and because of all of those things that have interacted that have ensured that there's a process where there is ample time for public input and testimony on, on proposals that come before uh, the MPCA, I'm sp speaking specifically in Minnesota now, um, I don't know that the Citizens <coughs> Council is really necessary because we do uh, embody all of the things that they brought to the table in the processes that have all come into play um, from 1967 to present day. Thank you, Jennifer. Mary Shapiro. I really don't know anything about the um, Citizens Council, and so I think I'll just leave that one. Thank you. Lori Pryor. Well, I, I have heard people talking about um, this citizen council that was banned. And their concern is that um, the citizen input has been silenced. And um, it's a perception, perhaps, but a perception that it's special interests now that are in control. And that, you know, kind of the, the common person is being shut out of the process um, and that they no longer have this advisory board. So I, I, I have heard discussions about it saying that this was a loss and that what we were lo losing was uh, the voice of the average citizen um, up against a fight with special interest. Um, but, you know, as David said, you know, there were probably issues the way it was, um, it was created. 
um, understanding the scope of it, and uh, you know, regulation needs to be predictable. You can't have a group that just throws everything out after, you know, after you know, maybe a business has gone through a long regulatory process. So I think it is something that we need to look at to make sure that people do feel like they have a voice in government and a voice in, about their environment. Thank you. Our next question is, um, we'll start with Ben Sherlock, followed by Steve Swazinski. Are you supportive of the Southwest Light Rail? Please give your reasons. I am absolutely supportive of the Southwest Light Rail. Southwest Light Rail is supported by the majority of our community members and Southwest Light Rail will bring new jobs to our community as well as allow us to connect to other communities and the downtown area. Uh, I take the bus to school currently and it gets pretty full sometimes. And sometimes I drive. That gets really full too. Traffic can be terrible. We need to alleviate that. We need a full complement of transportation infrastructure in our state. Thank you, Ben. Steve Swazinski. Well, this is uh, clearly an area where Senator Hand and I disagree. Uh, <laughs> Southwest Light Rail will increase our attractiveness as a region. It'll create tens of thousands of jobs. And it looks as though it's done. It's going to be built. We found the funding. Um, Met Council found the funding. And the last $114 million, the missing piece, <laughs> was found, but now is the time to keep moving forward. Let's, um, we dragged our feet for 10 years building light rail, and now it's time to start looking at the next project. And so that the millennials who are moving to Denver and Seattle and San Diego that have light rail lines established for them, so um, let's build the Botano line next, let's get all these other lines built up and um, not let these kids down that want to just get to work and um, um, connect the people with the economic opportunities that light rail will bring to the region. Thank you, Steve. David Han? Well, I, I've never voted in favor of the Southwest Light Rail uh, in the legislature, and I've never voted against it. We've never had a bill. Uh, there's never been hearings on the Southwest Light Rail in the legislature that have had votes, never had a vote on the floor, and has not passed through committees. This is a $2 billion project using public money. Uh, we had a big argument about a uh, a Viking Stadium that was half a billion dollars of public money and it went, took a couple of years and a lot of bills went through the process, amendments were, were uh, added and uh, then there were votes, votes in committees and votes on the floor. I think for a project of this magnitude and this size it needs to have that hearing. The public needs to weigh in the pros and cons and we have heard a lot about the Southwest Light Rail, a lot of it is advocacy, but there hasn't been a chance for the debate that occurs in the legislature and we need to have that. Uh, I think there are questions about uh, what happens to the bus system. Uh, that we like and have out here in Eden Prairie if this comes through. What happens to uh, uh, property taxes in Eden Prairie if this goes through? What happens to the state budget? What is the cost of the state budget ongoing with operating it? So uh, we're looking to win a majority of the state Senate for uh, Republicans uh, this, this fall. If we are successful, I'm going to ask and insist that the Met Council bring a bill to the legislature Thank and they have hearings in the House and the Senate and votes. Thank you, David. Lori Pryor. All right, so this is what I know about the Southwest Light Rail Transit. I know that the city of Minnetonka strongly supports it unanimously. I know that Eden Prairie City Council and Mayor supports it unanimously. I know that the Twin West Chamber supports it. Why do they all support it? They support it because it's going to be such a boom to the local economy. Eden Prairie and Minnetonka and Hopkins and St. Louis Park, all of the cities on the rail, the local economies are going to benefit. And it's a permanent change, not just a temporary, uh, because once a light rail is built, it's there. So you can build an apartment building like we're seeing in Hopkins right now. You can open up your business. You know workers can get there because there will be a light rail now and in the future. So it's good for the local economy. Environmentalists know that light rail is good because it's the lowest cost of energy. And also, we know it's important for the quality of life. No one likes traffic. And when we have 750,000 more people in the metro area, we will be glad we built the light rail. Thank you, Lori. Mary Shapiro. Well, I certainly know the importance of public transportation. I didn't even have a car until I was about 30 years old. I lived very close to a bus line, so I relied on the buses to take me everywhere. So I saved a lot of money on insurance and, and uh, car repairs. But uh, what I can't understand is the, what is the cost-benefit um, between the light rail and how, how does, 
What, what is the benefit of it? I, I know that it's hugely expensive. It's going to cost uh, $1.9 billion. Um, uh, it, it seems like the roads are much, um, would be a lot less expensive um, to repair. Like uh, for every uh, mile of um, light rail, it, it will cost 25 to $30 million. Uh, for every mile of, um, of, of road construction, it costs two to $5 million. And it's estimated that um, only two to three percent of traffic will um, be affected at all by the route. Thank you, Mary. Jennifer Lewin. Well, thank you. This is a topic that has come up a number of times over, over the years, and it's a, a topic that I've studied really closely for at least six years or more. Um, you know, asking people at Eden Prairie, surveying them about what they think, meeting with the business community, uh, city council members, and others. I guess, you know, a couple of things. One is that I, I have expressed some concerns uh, as the pathway or the proposed route was being built as to, you know, how many at-grade crossings would we have um, that might affect uh, other traffic or safety for citizens in Eden Prairie. Um, there's been a lot of concern and a lawsuit actually has been filed by the folks at Parks, Lakes and Parks Alliance, I think it is, in Minneapolis. And that lawsuit is actually going to be uh, the subject of, a, of an actual jury trial um, in September of next year. So um, I think the biggest question is how do we build a, a comprehensive transportation system in Minnesota? And part of that is transit. And then how do we pay for it? Um, what hasn't come up in the discussion of light rail, Southwest, or Botno or other lines is the fact that the quarter cent sales tax we currently pay for transit is not enough money to pay for the capital construction costs or the operating losses that occur from these transit lines. Thank you. All right, uh, um, we've got time for one more question this evening. And um, we will start with Steve Swazinski, followed by Ben Sherlock. If elected, what are your top three priorities? Number one, get that counselor to student ratio, improve upon that. 46th in the nation, we can um, do better than that. We pride ourselves in education and let's um, get that number down in the top 10. Number two, I would get light rail transit. Let's get this done. If we, the Met Council doesn't come up with the money, we can do better. And then thirdly, I guess I'd have to say we've got, I don't want another teacher to ever have to look at a classroom of students and explain to them we had another school shooting today. And I don't know the answer to that. All I know is we're letting them down and we can do better than we have done. And I just want the debate to begin and let's figure this out and tell our grandchildren we used to have mass school shootings at one time in American history, but we figured out how to prevent them. Thank you. Ben Sherlock? Number one for me is definitely education. Let's close that achievement gap, let's invest in pre-K, let's make college affordable for both people my age and people in the later years of life going back to college and changing their career. Number two for me is transportation. Light rail is very important. We need a full complement of transportation options in our state. And number three, I think, is health care. We need to make sure people have access to affordable and effective health care all throughout the state and have choice in their health care options. Thank you. Jennifer Moon? Well, um, education is clearly a topic we've talked about a lot tonight. And again, I think working to uh, bring more reforms uh, and more local control and uh, parents into the process of making sure that their children are getting the best possible education and that our policies really are student focused that we're focused on making sure that there's high expectations for our students, help for those kids who need it, and that we are not letting any student down in Minnesota in terms of the education that we're, the opportunity we offer them. Tax reform, uh, we've had a very good package put together, passed by 90% of the legislature to help middle class families with the cost of childcare, student loan debt, helping uh, reduce the burden on small businesses of their state property taxes, many other good proposals. That needs to happen. Uh, we're overpaying and it should be returned to, to Minnesota families. Finally, a comprehensive transportation system with discussion over transit, what that means, and how we're going to pay for it. Thank you. Mary Shapiro. Uh, 
education, of course. I uh, think that schools should be um, more accountable to how uh, the dollars are spent that are, are given to them. Uh, more um, money should be going directly to the classroom. I know that as a teacher. Uh, to close, that would be extremely important to close that achievement gap. I know, for example, that what, what did I need? I needed, um, I, ha I had a lot of kids with a lot of behavior problems, a lot of ADHD, a lot of um, different learning disabilities, and what would have been really important for me is to have more um, educational assistance assistance in the classroom so that they could take small groups or work one-on-one -on, -one on students. So that is where the money needs to go in education in the classroom. I would also work on um, tax policy. Taxes are way too high in Minnesota. Also, um, as I talk to um, people in the different businesses, construction, uh, the grocery business, I, I can see that regulation is really hurting them and hindering job production and making things more expensive for the consumer. Thank you, Mary. Lori Pryor. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's hard just to say there's three, but I'm going to give you three tonight that I would focus on. We've talked about universal background checks. That would be a priority for me. The next two we really haven't talked about tonight. One is about holding insurance companies accountable. We need to hold them accountable for not pulling the bait and switch and saying this drug is covered, and then you sign up for it and you find out it's not. Um, so there's things that insurance companies are doing now um, that we need to hold them accountable and, and have them stop doing. Um, so I will hold insurance companies accountable. And the, the last third priority that I want to bring up that we have not talked about tonight is mental health coverage and mental health. Um, we, right now, uh, according to NAMI, uh, this was what they're putting out, the National Association for Mental Illness, it's not that the mental health system is broken, the mental health system has never been built. We need more community-based programs, we need more hospital beds, and we need more, more providers. So this would be a, the third priority for me. Thank you. David Hahn? I think uh, one of the top priorities I have is we need to uh, restore our health insurance marketplace. Uh, after the reforms of MNsure and the ACA, we've seen health insurance premiums double. Uh, we've seen uh, availability disappear. Thousands of people have lost their insurance, have lost their coverage. And this is all on the heels of having very strong promises with these reforms that we implemented. We'd see premiums go down and access improvement hasn't happened. We need to change that. I think we can change that, but we need new leadership in St. Paul. Uh, tax and regulatory uh, policies in the state of Minnesota are chasing people out, chasing businesses, chasing individuals out. We need to stop doing that. We need to welcome people here. We need to have investment in this state for job growth and economic growth. The third thing is education. It's my passion. It's why I got involved in, uh, in politics, and it's a system problem. We need to restore the confidence that people have in their local school boards by empowering them to make meaningful decisions about how education takes place in the classroom. We need to do that. We can do that. And those will be my priorities. Thank you. Um, that <coughs> concludes our questions for this evening, so we'll proceed to our closing remarks. We'll start with Mary Shapiro, followed by Lori Fryer. Mary. Well, what I want to do is I want to um, spend the people's money very, very carefully. And um, I want to be accountable to um, my constituents. I want to be available to them um, to, to talk to. I want to respond to them quickly. Um, I want to do um, things that will um, help the ordinary family, uh, such as um, I work on the tax policy, um, and um, I also want to um, work very, um, very much on education. And um, I would also like to um, help with uh, straightening out the insurance mess. Thank you, Lori Pryor. Well, I think. Um, my closing remarks, I want to share with you things that I hear at the door when I'm out talking to the constituents, talking to the voters in this race. And um, there's two things that I've heard from that I think that it's important to share right now. One is that um, people, people are discouraged by the national campaigns and the negativity of it. And one thing that seems to help is when they see me at the door, talking with them, listening to them, then we're restoring a little bit of that faith in government because it's restoring that connection to government. It's not just ads on television, it's just not it's not just mailers, 
Um, it's not um, the sound bites that you hear on the radio, but it's a person at your door. And so what I would bring to the legislature and what I would bring as a, as a representative is that listener and being, being available to people. And when you make that connection, then you have that, that, um, that sense that you are connected to your government. And that's what's important, I think, right now. And the second part of it is just getting beyond the gridlock. Thank you very much. David Han. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for inviting me. It's been an honor for me to serve in the state senate. And our state does face significant challenges, challenges in health care, uh, challenges to our economy to provide growth and job opportunities for everybody, and challenges in our education system and restoring the ability for our educators to solve the problems in the classroom. Uh, so those significant challenges need leadership, and I think the background and experience that I've had uh, have prepared me to provide that leadership. And I look forward to working with you all on those problems going forward, and I ask for your support in November. Thank you. Thank you, David. Steve Swazinski. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters, and more importantly, thank you, Timer. Um, I'm used to talking for 86 minutes, so uh, for, to narrow this stuff down to one has been tough. And of course, thanks to all of you for attending tonight. We need environmental, physical, and mental health programs that are interconnected and designed to keep people well. We need an economy where everyone who works hard and plays by the rules can live with dignity of, the dignity of financial stability. We need to continually improve our wonderful educational system so that kids have the opportunity to come to school ready to learn and leave school prepared to follow their dreams. We need a transportation system for the 21st century, one that keeps us connected as a vibrant regional economy. What we do not need is more partisan politics and entrenched politicians which can only lead to more gridlock. We need a vibrant political process consisting of compromising and coming to common ground for the common good to create another Minnesota miracle. Thank you, Steve. Ben Sherlock. The man who I mentioned earlier at the very beginning, my grandfather who inspired me to run for office, he had a certain way of speaking. He was always short and to the point. And that was something I tried to live up to today. That's something I think a lot of people want. I've been hearing at the doors, they want someone who will spend more time listening than talking. And that would be my goal as your legislator, to spend more time listening to you than just telling you what I think about everything. I think we need to do a lot of work in the state, education, the environment, transportation, healthcare, but it's all stuff we can get done. And I look forward to working across the aisle to get those bread and butter issues that people care about up front at the forefront of our legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Moon. Well, thank you. Again, thanks to the League for organizing the forum for the um, great and, and thorough dialogue in many topic areas tonight. Um, again, it's been a privilege to work for this community for the past eight years in the State House. And throughout that time, I've really strived to be someone who's very accessible to, to all citizens of the community, holding numerous town hall meetings, surveys, um, going door to door, and really listening to what your concerns are. I think uh, as we strive to resolve some of the problems that face Minnesota, one of the things that always comes across to me and is echoed in many of your comments is, is looking for common ground with some common sense and making sure that there's balance in the proposals that we bring forward. And um, <clears throat> I want to be respectful always of the, the hardworking families and taxpayers of the state as we strive to make sure that we're putting money into our critical programs. We've discussed them tonight, education, making sure our children aren't left behind, but also making sure that our businesses can thrive so that all of our kids can have the kind of jobs and the kind of future that we want for them. So again, I value the trust the voters have placed in me, and uh, I'm hoping that the hard work I've done for you uh, will earn me your vote on November 8th. Thank you, Jennifer. That concludes our candidate forum this evening.